Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on your time zone. It is absolutely wonderful to be back with you all for our new episode of Talking Climate, this time focused on the participatory arts campaign Beyond Lies, which builds fossil fuel media literacy through community engagement with the work of the celebrated data journalist and illustrator Mona Chalabi, whom you'll meet in just a moment. Before I introduce Mona and our other remarkable panelists, um, I want to remind people who've been with us before and introduce people who are new to Talking Climate of our house rules, which are essentially simply to be as interactive as you possibly can. Please drop your comments and thoughts into the chat. Tell us, tell us where you're listening in from, um, ask questions of the panelists, and we'll be sure to try to get to those. Um, and in general, connect with each other and use it as an opportunity to connect with these three extraordinary leaders um, in very different ways. So we look forward to hearing from you throughout the show. Um, and here on the Climate Museum team, we have a feedback loop, so we will be hearing your comments and your questions and able to respond to them. I want to uh, first ask everyone to join me in a land acknowledgement, and you can read more about land acknowledgement practices and indigenous justice more generally in the resources guide that will be emailed to you after the show. Um, but here in the United States, we stand on unceded indigenous and native lands. In my case, specifically here in modern day Manhattan, Lenape Hoking and, and ask you to join us in respecting leaders past, present, and emergent of Native and Indigenous communities um, and in joining in solidarity with the fight forward for Indigenous justice. In deciding to focus on fossil fuel disinformation for a participatory arts campaign, we at the Climate Museum were making a choice that was more angular and more confrontational in many ways than choices we had previously made in other arts campaigns. And we think it bears a moment of explanation as to why. Personally, I became aware of the extent of fossil fuel disinformation, its pervasiveness in our society and its critical role in securing delay of climate action at a meaningful scale by government at all levels and across the private sector through delay of climate action when I encountered the work of another one of our panelists, Amy Westervelt. I'd heard about fossil fuel disinformation and the fact that Exxon knew, hashtag Exxon knew about it for many years while continuing to greenwash um, and parrot nonsense but I didn't know how deep the story ran until I encountered Amy's podcast, Drilled, which I highly recommend to everyone who's here today if you haven't already um, taken it in. And what we came to believe as a team was that this information, this disinformation by the fossil fuel industry is not only much more pervasive than we were aware, even though we consider ourselves to be fairly media savvy people, fairly skeptical toward the um, PR practices of corporate America and so on, this disinformation and this PR effort is more pervasive and more shaping of our media landscape um, than was intuitive to us. Um, and that told us that there was a, a there there, something to explore. Second, what Amy's work makes clear is the role that this disinformation has played in a very material sense in delaying meaningful action on climate. Um, so it is one of the critical factors, surely not the only one, but a very, very central factor in why we are where we are, facing 8.7 million deaths a year from fossil fuel particulate matter alone. That's the fifth largest cause of death in the world every year. 
we're just starting this headcount, scientists are, and recently they added another 5 million deaths a year from extreme hot and cold events. So this is a ranked, fossil fuels cause are one of the key drivers of human death, and that's not even to count human suffering and other profound losses. Um, so this disinformation is um, so, um, it, it, it's so consequential in its impacts on our health and well-being um, that we knew we had to do something about it that would build community and bring forward its actionability. It's not just something we have to accept. And that's, that's the third thing that we wanted to make sure this campaign communicated. So pervasiveness, the critical causation nexus between the disinformation and the lack of climate action that's put us in this emergency. And then third, this is actionable. We can build community for the truth. Um, and so we were extraordinarily lucky when we reached out to the celebrated Mona Chalabi and asked her whether she'd be willing to distill some takeaways for us in a short series of posters you'll see now um, called Beyond Lies as a whole. The three areas of misrepresentation that we think are most critical for all of us to understand and for all of us to take action on. First, the fossil fuel industry wants us to believe that everything that's happening ecologically in the world and with the climate crisis is our fault as individuals. But we know we want to move beyond individual blame, which is a lie, to the truth of collective responsibility expressed in policy. The fact that you'll, that you'll see in a moment when we pull up this individual poster so you can get a closer look at it, um, and Mona, I'll ask you to, to get into it as well, um, is that an oil company, specifically in this case BP, generated the term carbon footprint in 2004 to tap into people's sense of individual guilt and responsibility and keep us from focusing on their responsibility for the climate crisis. It's a brilliant tactic. It's been brilliantly successful. It taps into a deep cultural strain of individualism and self-blame. Um, and it, it's, uh, it, it is not the only evidence, but it is very strong evidence that we have a worthy adversary in the fossil fuel industry. This is a brilliant PR tactic um, that's with us to this day and keeps people thinking that their agency as individuals, as citizens in the broad sense, not in the national paper sense, but the citizen of the world sense, lies in consumer choice alone and not in broader civic and political agency. The second lie that we think brings a key takeaway with it is the greenwashing lie. And these are not lies in the technical actionable sense of false statements that you can disprove. It's distraction. So Exxon, for example, spends an enormous advertising budget every year with these beautiful, charismatic, bright green ads, um, beautifully produced in, in, in primetime television that communicate that Exxon is moving with us toward a bright and a green and a healthy future. Um, in fact, essentially all of their capital is spent trying to discover and exploit and burn more fossil fuels. And their plan is to burn more in 2030 than they burn now. Uh, but you would never know that from looking at their empty promises. So we want to move beyond the empty promise of fossil fuel companies as motors of progress toward a bright and just and safe future um, and toward the reality that we need to stop burning fossil fuels now. Uh, the International Energy Agency, which is really not an activist organization in the slightest, um, has taken that position and all experts on fossil fuel combustion take the same position. We cannot get to a safe future if we continue to burn fossil fuels. And then finally, the third takeaway is that we need to move beyond the business as usual, pursuant to which the fossil fuel industry has a major voice in shaping our public policy and in blocking clean energy stress and investment and development toward the truth of a community empowered and community run policy that's accountable to us in which we're moving 
very quickly and very ambitiously toward renewable energy and just distribution of environmental benefits and harms across our society. Um, so I'll have Mona talk about what is depicted in this poster in a moment, but we wanna go beyond the lies that are embedded in business as usual um, to the truth of a pu public policy that is collectively accountable and responsible for the well-being of our communities. With that, I'd like to ask you, Felicia, to bring up our panel. Um, and first, we're gonna stay with you for a moment, Mona. Um, hi, friends. Um, but Jasmine and Amy, if you could give a wave, and everyone will be hearing more from, from Jasmine and Amy as the hour proceeds. Um, but first, Mona, um, I wanted to ask you if you could talk about what caught your eye about this project? You get offered and asked to do so many different things. What felt important about this to you? Honestly, you all caught my eye. I feel like um, the collaborators that I'm working with aren't necessarily, um, I feel like either they're not necessarily invested in getting the research right, what they're more focused on is the, the visual kind of final output. And it felt like right from the get go, we were on the same page about making sure that the information was absolutely kind of beyond, beyond a shadow of a doubt about getting it exactly right. And I also really enjoy projects that mean that I learn something. I had no clue about anything to do with anything that is depicted on this poster. I don't think that I fully grasped it. I had some idea about greenwashing, you know, I knew that um, things do tend to continue business as usual. But for example, it was my first time learning that the carbon footprint had come from the fossil fuel industry. Um, and in a way, sometimes that ignorance is a real asset when it comes to creating these kind of visual designs, because that ignorance means that I'm coming to it really, really fresh. And that incredulity and that shock, I'm trying to then put that into the final visual element that we kind of come up with together. Agreed. There's something very clarifying in your, your distillation was super clarifying. And I absolutely agree that there's a freshness expressed in the perception. I, 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 I think people who see the posters can feel your surprise in a way at how bad it is. You knew it was bad, right? We all know, we all expect it to be bad, which is not as it should be, but it's, it's our lived reality at the moment, but it is much, much worse than most people imagine. And your, your work brings that across so vibrantly and so powerfully. Um, was that was that the the fact that most uh, that most captured your attention or most surprised you the carbon footprint the kind of temerity of the carbon footprint invention? It might be you know I remember with this we had a, a Google Doc going that was like several pages long with information that we were we were trying to figure out if that could land in the posters and very often actually my work kind of goes the other way actually where i'm really scrambling to find good evidence for the things that i'm interested in exploring subject matter wise um the data just isn't collected or it doesn't exist so um in this case there was just such an abundance that it's hard like yeah, it's hard now to remember the one specific one that stood out the most, but honestly, the carbon footprint thing came as a real, a real shock to me. Yeah. It was very creative of them. <laughs> it was. It's genius. They were, yeah. they, were, they were not using their power for good, but it's an extraordinarily brilliant um, rhetorical move on their part. Um, so could you talk us through the posters a little? There are recurrent visual themes that I, I didn't that I, I didn't want to do any spoiler alerts in the intro, mm -hmm. but tell us what you were thinking about the the basic design and the elements that recur, if you would. So um, again, with this project, it felt really, really collaborative. Like I really felt like it wasn't just me creating these. It was truly um, in conjunction with the Climate Museum. We spent a lot of time talking through what were the elements that we wanted to keep? What were the main things that we wanted to communicate? So the way that we landed on this triangle was in talking a lot about perspective, right? That when it comes to the fossil fuel industry, very often things feel too far away. And it's that feeling of kind of distance that makes feel unattainable sometimes and kind of makes you feel a little bit hopeless. But what we were trying to play with was that there is something in the foreground which is attainable, which you can reach, 
And in reaching that thing in the foreground, you ultimately end up creating change further down the line in the background. Um, and I think a kind of triangle does that. It also just looks, you know, sometimes you, you want stuff to also just look kind of appealing and look a little bit different as well. Um, so that was the thinking on this real emphasis on perspective. And it also really plays up, you see, it especially with, um, as, as you said, this idea of lies, what we were trying to communicate is there's something going on up here, but you have to be paying attention to your term perspective of what's really going on. Um, and then the other part of it was that, as I mentioned, there was a lot of data that we wanted to communicate. So typically I'm creating data visualizations that are just synthesizing one set of information. But even within any given one of these posters, there might be two statistics that are kind of in that, that summary at the bottom. So instead now, what we're trying to communicate with the visuals is not one particular number, but is instead an idea or, um, yeah, it's, we're trying to communicate a kind of a fact that is broader than one given statistic. And in doing that, actually, I think we all decided pretty early on that it was really, really important to have humans in this, right? Like that the fossil fuel industry very often feels quite faceless, um, and that facelessness also contributes to our feeling of powerlessness, right? Like, who do you attack? Who who are going to be in the headlines of like this monsters? This like you know terrible person is doing this and that. There's not when you don't have individuals, there isn't the same accountability. So we kind of almost wanted to come up with a a hypothetical individual here, and honestly, of course, he had to be a white man. That also felt um, really relevant when we when we think about. Um, who are the beneficiaries of the fossil fuel industry and also who are honestly the losers of that industry as well. That's right. Many white men who are allies in the climate fight and many white men who are suffering because of the climate crisis, but the structures of white supremacy and sexism um, and the, the, rain, it's not too much to say, the fossil fuel industry are all tied up with each other in history. Um, and those who suffer the worst consequences of our current climate crisis are dis disproportionately people of color around the globe and women as well, um, less, somewhat less intuitively to American audiences. Um, but so, so that did feel very important. We didn't want to be um, simplistic about it but it would have felt yeah. not honest in another way, I think. And to your point about simplicity, we talked a lot about that final poster. Who are going to be the characters that are sitting around the table and who are going to be the characters that are taking this guy away, right? And we also felt it was really, really important that sitting around that table is not exclusively white men. And equally, it's not just, you know, two women of colour that are hauling this guy away, that we add that level of complexity. Yeah. Absolutely. It's not, a, it's not a simple thing, but there is a basic underlying dynamic that needs to be communicated um, in a non-demagogic way. And for those who haven't yet, for those who are new to the posters, definitely check out beyondlies.org. You can zoom in and get a closer look and see the, the, the person, how the, the human personifying, the character personifying Exxon travels across uh, the, the disinformation, ending in his expulsion from the table of decision making, um, and what what I what one of the the things that you just said that is so striking to me is this idea that if you reach the foreground of the poster, you end up reaching the end, and the same is true of the series as it progresses. It's really when you're starting to become. Um, someone who takes action on climate and frames your own identity in that way, it's about getting started. And we'll have more to say on that later. Um, but I think your posters capture that sense of getting an entree um, and then the rest is much easier. Um, so I do want, I, I want to, um, we asked Jasmine um, if she would have had questions for you and Amy um, as a young climate advocate starting off. Um, and Jasmine, I can read your question if you like, or if you have it in front of you, you could read it to Mona. Um, I just want to make sure that you have a chance to ask your question of Mona uh, before she has to leave us. Yeah, I was going to say, would I would have you... it in front of me. Oh, yeah. Okay, I, great. If, mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, Jasmine. Um, hi. Uh, so I can start with my question for Mona. 
So this kind of was inspired by a lot of artists I know who I currently go to high school with. So basically my question is, what is your advice for young artists who want to use their artistic abilities for activism yet are currently unsure on how to begin to do so? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a really, really good one, you know. Um, so I can, I'm always hesitant to start off by describing my own journey because obviously it's not perfectly replicable, everyone's different. But my own journey in creating these visuals just started out of sheer frustration. I have no background in art whatsoever. Um, I was stuck in a really, really awful dead end journalism job and just started to draw at my desk. And I think my advice would be get started, even if you literally have no artistic talent. I still honestly, like, I just cannot believe that I'm getting paid to do this. Because if you actually look at the characters that I draw, they're literally the stuff of nightmares. My friends tease me all the time of like, how <laughs> like, I'm drawing something crazy, which is just like a terrifying baby. Like, it's all awful, awful, awful. But it's okay. <laughs> it's the exercise getting and and what's more important sometimes is the ideas that you're trying to communicate right and i have no doubt that your your friends and your peers who you're talking about have those ideas right even if they're not quite sure how to put them out into the world um and then in terms of that really really crucial step of getting them out at the time i you know i think i had like 47 followers on Instagram and I just started to post them and it started to get you know a bit of traction I, I'm really honestly quite hesitant to suggest social media these days Instagram is dead anyway as I'm sure you know <laughs> like it's all about um TikTok but I don't know how again how replicable that model is right like it's really disenchanting that you put out work and even the museum will know this right like everyone knows that feeling of putting out work that you've like labored over and it just doesn't get the attention that you're hoping for so I would just say, like, continue to be creative and like, you know, is there a version of the work that could exist purely as a WhatsApp forwarded message that like is going to be shared on that network? Is there a version of the artwork that can be, um, you know, put in, in, in public places and ideally in those public places that resonate with the subject matter that you're trying to communicate, right? So if it's like, you know, um, this is a really bad example, I'm really sorry. And also potentially quite patronizing that I'm gonna use a school example, I hope not. But like, if you know that one particular teacher is receiving like a scholarship stipend thing from a fossil fuel industry, could you put something on their car, a little piece of paper on their car that kind of calls them out? Terrible example, you know. But like the idea of site specific work feels, feels really, really powerful. And yeah, honestly, my main advice is just like, just start, just start um, and, when you start just make sure that whoever whoever you are supposedly advocating on behalf of that's not your own community just don't speak on behalf of anyone else if you can just make sure that they're you know um they're a part of that conversation yeah thank you jasmine thank you that was a really thoughtful answer and i feel like that's definitely something that can apply to like you know really anyone who like you know wants to start but you know they just don't know how to so yeah. i guess and it's not just as well. Sorry, just one last thing like whatever your talent is right if it's music data sonification like you know or yeah. any kind of sonification like there will always be something that you can make and do yeah sorry i cut yeah, you off of course no no it's okay yeah um so i guess kind of my second question which was for amy so again this is kind of inspired by stuff i've seen in kind of like i guess my environment of like attending a high school and like having a lot of friends that are write climate articles for the school newspaper. So I guess mm -hmm. like generally speaking, what advice would you have for student journalists who want to use their position to push for more climate action within their school communities, especially from an investigative perspective? That's a great question. Um, it's funny, actually, I, I feel like my um, path is somewhat similar to Mona's in that like I was doing very like straightforward journalism that I wasn't enjoying very much. <laughs> <laughs> and and I was interested in all these things and I was like, I'm just going to start digging into it and, you know, figure out how I'm going to make money doing it later. <laughs> you know? um, so, uh, so yeah, I would say like, if there's something that, that they are seeing that um, they just think is slightly strange that they want to know more about what's behind it, just start digging into that. And then, um, especially if they are interested in fossil fuel influence in their, in the school setting, there's a ton of that, um, uh, like asking teachers where they're getting materials from, 
Um, if they see something that is coming up, like the, the main way I'm seeing it now is um, oil companies are really into doing STEM career fairs at schools these days. So if they're seeing that, like who's behind that? Um, they work with discovery um, of the Discovery Channel fame a lot in schools. <laughs> uh, so if you're seeing like a Discovery Channel sponsored event, like ask questions about that. <laughs> um, and uh, honestly, I think probably there are at least some teachers that might be um, real allies in that. Like they don't, in my experience anyway, like inter, uh, we just did a whole series on um, how fossil fuel companies are infiltrating um, schools at all levels, elementary, high school and university and, and the way that that shows up. And for the most part, the teachers that we talked to were like, I don't have time to dig into, you know, three layers of backstory on where um, an activity book is coming from or a film that we're showing in class or whatever. Like I try to vet things, but like we can't expect teachers to all be climate experts and spe and especially to be like climate disinformation experts. So, um, so you know, in general, they they welcome the information <laughs> and like they want to they want to know too where stuff is coming from so there's that the other thing that um i always recommend to um people who are trying to get into doing more investigative work is um archives most corporations um have are like archived i mean it's crazy i don't think they do it anymore because they've sort of realized that you know they're they're like showing their whole ass to the public you know? yes. <laughs> but um, but um, there are like there's tons of them all over the country. There's um, industry like industry organization archives, um, and they're open to any kind of researcher. A student journalist could absolutely get in like access to these, and they're fascinating because it's like the internal communications between like the PR person and the company or. Um, or you know the the strategy document that they laid out for this campaign so you can see like this was their goal and like this is how they measured success and this is how they planned out how they were going to do it it's it's fascinating um actually for the art students too there's crazy interesting art stuff in there <laughs> like a lot of the the graphic design from you know mobile in the 70s i'm like i have to say actually oh we can sh i can show um there's this esso campaign that um they did a series of ads where like they really were hammering on the point of um of how here it is yeah oil brings like they were just like they really wanted to, to bring home the fact that fossil fuels like make your life work and um and so there's like this one and they have another one that's like oil brings shelter and oil brings you know travel or whatever um so yeah just just like the the history of sort of how the industry has always kind of talked about these things it's really really interesting um to me and sorry last thing um they started investing in school like in the 40s in part because not just because they wanted to be like you know pro oil but because they wanted to instill in the minds of young people um, the idea that that uh, free market capitalism is something that must always be protected at all costs and that it is something that makes you american and gives you independence and like i mean it's very very like there's some very interesting strategy documents from um pr guys like in the the late 40s especially right after world war ii being like uh oh the U.S. government has just actually been making people's lives work and like, <laughs> oh, no, the jig is up. Um, so they really started heavily investing in in like economics, education, um, political science, creating all these materials around, you know, really shaping people's understanding of like the American identity and economy and stuff. So that's an area to look at because I, I think it's been wildly underexplored. There's like, there's been some, some stuff about how the science has been tampered with, but I think the the way that they have focused on the social sciences is um, really, really interesting and and almost, almost more damaging to uh, climate action because it there's these ideas that I still hear people saying today that are like, but what about jobs? But what about, you know, <laughs> like, what about the American way of life? Like, well, where, like, where do you hear ideas about what that is come from? You know, who who created what we think of as the American way of life and who was included in that, you know, idea and who wasn't and why? Um, and 
oil companies have their fingerprints all over that stuff. So, um, so yeah, I guess my point is just like, there's a really wide swath of things that they can look at um, beyond just where we get energy from. Yeah, I was gonna say thank you for that answer. Um, I feel like I had no idea about the discovery, uh, like oh, yeah. channel thing. Like I had no idea, and I felt yeah. like that was a special. I'm convinced that like an oil company yeah. actually helped fund the creation of the Discovery Channel. Because when you think about it, you're like, whoa! Like half their shows are glorifying extraction. Like my husband, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. is a huge fan of all the like gold treasure hunting shows on Discovery. Yeah. But it's like. It's like industrial fishing, mining, like all these things. Yeah. And then the other half are like nature shows that present the idea of nature as like separate from us, as like this thing that we yeah. admire, very pretty, it's off in the distance and whatever. And I'm like, I'm, yeah, I haven't found like the, I haven't found the receipts yet, but I'm convinced there's something very fishy with the creation of that channel. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, yeah. yeah. Cause I was thinking especially the part about career fairs, cause I'm a junior in high school. So like, I feel like that's something yeah. definitely like a lot of like my friends or like people that are beginning to like enter that part of kind of like, I guess graduation yeah. and all the preparation that happens before that. That's definitely something interesting to keep in mind, but yeah. Yeah, they have something called the, um, the Discovery STEM Careers Coalition. And the two main anchor partners in that are the fricking American Petroleum Institute and Chevron. And then there's this thing that's like the, the Manufacturing Accountability Project that's a, a subgroup of um, the National Association of Manufacturers. Those, I mean, API and NAM, they're like the, original architects of climate denial um so the idea that they're like you know i mean the oil industry has a very serious talent shortage problem and like people are not you know coming out of school looking to get into that industry right now for lots of reasons not just the climate stuff but because it you know it's sort of an industry in decline these jobs aren't available anymore whatever so they're they're putting a lot of money into um, those those careers. The videos alone are hilarious. There's there's a video of like a Chevron engineer who talks about going to work on an offshore platform like it's a yacht. It's hilarious. She's like, I just get on the helicopter and we land on the helipad in the middle of the ocean, and you're like, okay. <laughs> Sounds yeah. so generous. Anyway. It does. She makes it sound like something the Kardashians are like lining up to do. <laughs> yeah. Part of it, I mean, one of the lessons in this project and in this conversation is there is nothing too shameless. There's nothing too disconnected from what is real um, and yeah. what is um, good for humanity as a whole that for, for them to promote it. There's, there's no restraint there at all. Um, so yeah. you find yourself sometimes, or I find myself, I'll, 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 I'll say occasionally like they did not, <laughs> um, yeah. even though I think I've already hit the maximum level of expectation of exceptionally destructive, dishonest practices. Uh, they're always, they always, there's no bottom that you can touch. Um, there's no, mm -hmm. there's no limit to it. Um, but and on, I feel Jasmine. Sure. And, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just going to jump in and say, just um, um, going back to the the earlier point as well, just that the visuals are a really key part of their success in that that they do produce these yeah. beautiful polished graphics and like their ads are the best ads that exist. And even the graphic design, I can't remember what was the name of the designer, but I went to like this um, small museum of all of this prolific designer's work, and he done a ton for the fossil fuel industry and he was like at the height of his career when he was making it and what it mm. does is it just neuters, neuters some of that evil and just yeah everything's polished and beautiful and it's highly effective anyway i'm sorry miranda i didn't mean to cut you off no <laughs> yeah no no, 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 no apo your apology is rebuffed as we like to say <laughs> <laughs> It's a great point. And Amy, you might remember when we first started talking to you, we were thinking about using a Super Bowl ad as part of the, in some way oh, in the yeah. campaign. Super Bowl ad from, I want to say right, maybe right after um, Trump was elected. And it makes you want to drink crude oil. It makes oil and gas yeah, <laughs> so attractive, so like sexy yeah. and beautiful and glamorous and um, the, it's a, a super diverse cast and the production values are unbelievably high. It's like a major motion picture of, 
this extravaganza of worldly delights all about oil. It's, 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 yeah. it's exceptionally effective. Um, yeah. So is that, would you say, um, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting about the thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, they, even made, they actually made a feature film in, um, I think it was Standard Oil of New Jersey made a feature film, again, I think maybe late 40s, early 50s, that won a freaking Oscar. Um, and no one questioned that, like, it was a glamorization of, you know, the fossil fuel industry. It's called Louisiana Story. And it's just like, about a boy that lives near an oil field, you know? <laughs> it's really, it's wild. Yeah. <laughs> This is equal wild. So I want to, um, Jasmine, I had something I wanted to, to say um, in response to your excellent interview of Mona and, and Amy. But Mona, I know you're going to have to jump soon. So I wanted to ask you if you could just quickly tell us what you see next for yourself as a climate protagonist. Um, what's coming up? Um, and then Amy and, and Jasmine, we'll be back with you. Um, it's a really good question. I, I'm honestly not totally sure. Um, last year I did a small collaboration with a company called Blue Land and it just really, really got me thinking about not just um, visual design, but the idea of kind of making like, yeah, um, products that are really, really um, thoughtful and ecological. And I know obviously that's really, really problematic because it's still tied up with consumerism and potentially individualism as well. But I, I just... Um, I thought it's a really, really interesting opportunity to communicate different ways of living. And one of the things that um, that company does is, you know, even just tips on, um, yeah, I don't know. I know it's really, really problematic because it still makes it all about uh, individual responsibility, but I just found it a really exciting project to work on. Um, but yeah. And also just, I, I don't actually have a pension scheme, but at some point this year I need to set up a pension scheme and just making sure that my climate activism is making sure that none of that pension money is going towards anything evil. It feels kind of important. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's super important. We actually, um, one of the actions we encourage people to take is to move their their even their checking accounts from from wherever they probably yeah. are also feel free bank and to communicate about that critically because most people's checking accounts don't represent a sizable enough sum to dent Chase's sense of itself in the world or the fossil fuel industry sense of itself in the world. But if you talk about it and if you communicate with your bank about it, it starts to make a difference and we can start to move toward a financial system that rewards renewables um, and just systems of distribution rather than the fossil fuel culture and economy that we inhabit. Um, so Mona, I want to ask everybody to join me in thanking you so much for being with us today. Um, for your posters, it's been such a joy and an honor to work with you and to get to know you and to be able to share your, your incredibly powerful distillation um, of what we've learned about fossil fuel disinformation with the, with the world. So thank you so much. Thank you all so much. And honestly, it was such a pleasure to make these. Um, and just thank you for the opportunity. So, yeah, I hope we stay in touch, all of us. We thank definitely you. will. We can care. <laughs> yeah. well. Bye. Bye. Um, Amy, a, a question for you. The, the fossil fuel disinformation has been getting more attention lately than I've been aware of it's getting in the past. And that's in yeah. part, the, it, it's your work has obviously been critical and foundational to that. The House investigation into fossil fuel disinformation has raised some public awareness. Now the war in Ukraine has um, inflected the conversation and, and brought to the fore the question of whether we want more fossil fuel exploitation or less, uh, to put it in an initially neutral way. Um, mm -hmm. What is it that you think most important for people to take away about this disinformation campaign that they've been doing for for decades there's so much there but what's a what's a takeaway that people can carry forward from your perspective i think um you know for me i don't know i think the thing that i think that like sort of makes the penny drop for me a lot is just that you know um it's not just that, like the the disinformation didn't start with 
climate change. They started laying the groundwork for the disinformation about climate change, you know, like 150 years ago, you know. Um, so by the time you get to climate change, they have a machine that um, that not only is like very good at sort of spinning things in a way that that um, works for them, but they've laid all this groundwork to make sure that people see the oil industry a certain way and that people see um, the environment as separate from themselves and that people see that that you must always be making trade-offs between the environment and the economy. Um, these are like really, really deeply entrenched ideas in particularly American society that I think um, a lot of people like don't even necessarily question. Uh, like you still hear people talking about the the economic versus environmental thing all the time when when issues come up around climate policy and other types of environmental policy. And even that, which I, I think for at least for me, seems so objectively true right um is is kind of a figment of the the fossil fuel industry um over the last century so i think like i guess the takeaway is sort of you know question some of your deeply held beliefs and where they came from <laughs> because a lot of times you know they came from someone who had an agenda of some kind um and you know that climate disinformation did, does not begin and end with climate denial. I think that's a really important thing for, for people to understand that like the, the propaganda machine that they have built is much deeper and much broader than just the tactic that they've used to combat climate science. That's, that's such an important revelation, I'm sure, to most, to most people. Um, who are in our audience right now, and certainly was to me following your most recent um, seasons of Drilled. Yeah. It's the, the idea that it's not, in one sense, it's unique in that it, and, and can be separated out. And it's important to separate it out because it has the capacity to end our civilization um, right. and to cause a level of suffering that's, that's, that's inexpressible. But on the other hand, it's embedded, the reason, part of the reason it's so effective, it's just embedded in this whole cultural and ideological system that's been developed and articulated to feel natural, to feel like it just is what is, when in yeah. fact, it's the product of very careful, very self-serving decision-making uh, by yeah. the American Petroleum Institute and others, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the most recent thing that I found, and actually this is the little preview of the next season of Drill I'm working on, is that um, I, I, and this is sort of how I end up working on things in general, is like, I'll see something that seems really, really entrenched, and, I, and I'm like, what, how did that become such an entrenched idea, and who was involved? And I start looking back, and oftentimes I find oil companies. So in this case, I was noticing the oil companies really... Um, making a lot of free speech arguments a lot around climate disinformation. You, you heard it throughout the climate disinformation hearings that the House Oversight Committee was having, not just from the um, fossil fuel executives, but also from some of the heavily fossil fuel funded uh, politicians that were um, you know, in that that hearing as well, who were saying, oh, you know, this is actually a First Amendment infringement. Um, these criticisms about what you've said about climate change are, you know, dangerously close to a, um, a major infringement of your First Amendment rights. And I, I so that made me want to look at, you know, okay, what we all kind of know about Citizens United in, 20, in 2010, but what was happening before then? And when did oil companies start to coalesce around this argument? And what I found was that the entire notion of corporate free speech was created by oil companies <laughs> back in the 60s. Um, so like there's just, and, and there again, this was before, um, you know, before climate change was a policy concern for them, they were probably already starting to become more aware about, um, you know, the impact that greenhouse gas emissions had on the atmosphere by that point. They certainly had scientists that were working on that issue by that point, but they weren't seeing it as like a real policy threat. They were more thinking about other kinds of issues that, um, you know, they wanted to be able to talk about and that they wanted to be able to advertise about in a way that, um, that they were worried the laws wouldn't allow. So they really started to push 
the idea of um, of corporate free speech, of corporations as people, all of that stuff starts with the oil companies too. So um, yeah, I just, I'm consistently like surprised at how many things that are such a embedded part of how our society works came from the fossil fuel industry. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, wow. crazy. Mm -hmm. Profound, and it means there are so many footholds for people to get started as you and I were advising Jasmine. Um, and it, if we could um, bring up that photo of Jasmine with her parents, I wanna ask you, Jasmine, what it's been like to campaign around this information that Amy has brought to the world and to light and um, to use Mona's posters doing it. Um, but there, there are so many different footholds that people are finding and exploiting. And when we make a call to action at the end of the show, I'll say just a little bit more about that. But for now, Jasmine, you have been um, putting up posters all around New York City. You've been discussing this disinformation policy and campaign um, that's distilled in the posters with your family and with friends. Um, if we could pull up the picture of, of Jasmine at the launch of Beyond Live in the, in the summer. Um, tell us what it's been like. Tell us what people have responded to most strongly. What's been difficult about bringing this campaign to your community um, and, and what, what's been rewarding. T tell us about your experience. Yeah, so I would say overall, like this whole program and kind of like the whole process of like hanging up posters and using it as a conversation point, it's been really rewarding, especially I would think in the context of like family relations. So like, I'm one of the youngest people in my family. And like, there's a big kind of like age gap of like 60 years between me and like most of my aunts or so. So like one day we were all kind of like sitting around a table and I was telling them about Beyond Lies and then they were able to like we talked about fossil fuel disinformation and also kind of like, you know, the history of how like fossil fuel, um, the impacts of fossil fuels disproportionately impact black and brown communities. So then like, I like told them about the disinformation campaign, but then like we immediately kind of like, it turned into a longer conversation about like kind of their experiences with like asthma, kind of like growing up in like Harlem and stuff like that. And also kind of like on my dad's side as well, that was a big conversation we had. So it's been really great for kind of like bridging generational divides in the climate crisis and then also kind of like in the context of school where I've like distributed a lot of these posters and discussed it um it's been great for kind of like deepening conversations around climate because I do attend like a private school that's like majority white and majority wealthy so a lot of like conversations around climate it's a lot of them at least kind of as we were like starting especially in like the elementary and middle school it was a lot more surface level like recycle but it didn't really go into like the systemic issues. So Beyond Lies has been a starting point for having like, you know, deeper conversations about kind of like the systemic causes of climate change um, and such that kind of like how we can, you know, do a better job as a school community of kind of like attacking the issue at its root, kind of like, you know, having discussions with the administration about kind of like, you know, endowments and like kind of like where they're getting the funds from and like conversations about divestment. So kind of like mm -hmm. in those two, general spheres of my life, that's where I found kind of like the most rewarding aspects of like hanging up these posters. Um, when I like went out and like uh, hung them up around New York City and also kind of like brought them to my family members of my school. But yeah. And I think you've um, gone a, a good distance toward toward answering something, but I want to make sure that you have a chance to, to spell it out for our audience. Um, You've organized a whole school assembly around this project. You've been um, t talking to your relatives, hanging posters all over the city. Why is it so important to you to get your peers thinking and talking about fossil fuel disinformation and the climate crisis and the systems in which those things are embedded? Yeah, so I would say mostly it kind of like relies, I guess, like just given kind of like the time in which I've like, I was born and kind of like when I'm growing up in like, it's an undoubtable fact that like, the impacts of this crisis are going to have like, you know, negative implications for my future, as well as the future of many of my peers, um, like my younger cousins and stuff like that. So it's kind of like, as a generation, we have like no 
other choice but to face this crisis head on and try to do everything we can in our like you know willpower to you know prevent this crisis from worsening and part of that is addressing kind of like the systemic causes of the crisis um for me also it's because a lot of kind of like the issues that like you know climate change was caused by by kind of like corporations and kind of like disinformation by kind of like you know the wealthy and like you know systemically kind of like oppressing um lower income people in black and brown communities it ties into kind of like so many other issues that are important to my friends like i have lots of friends that do a lot of like work for kind of like you know racial justice advocacy and also like queer advocacy so kind of like seeing how like repeatedly it's kind of like these same groups of people trying to kind of like prevent i guess you know a marginalized group or like in this case of the climate crisis it really is kind of like it's a issue i mean like issues of kind of like queer identity and racial justice ob obviously impacts everyone but the climate crisis also is one of those issues that you know it's going to impact everyone and we have like no choice but to face it so kind of like seeing the intersectionality between kind of the issues that like you know my friends advocate for and also just kind of like the daily experiences of my friends whether or not if they're involved in activism it kind of leaves us with like you know no choice but to kind of like fight for you know climate justice you know for the sake of our peers for our livelihoods and you know for kind of like our world in general so that's kind of the main reason i'm involved i guess like kind of my start in climate advocacy was kind of in fifth grade because my school has like this wildlife conservation club but the teacher made sure like whenever we were doing conservation it tied into work with the climate crisis so that's kind of where i like got my start and it just went from there and then it was compounded by kind of like this stuff i was experiencing at my school and also in my neighborhood and seeing that contrast and then it all kind of eventually led me into work regarding climate justice but yeah fantastic thank you very much for that so we're drawing up toward the hour but I want to very quickly ask both of you before I make a call to action to everyone who's out there to join this campaign, um, which ends at the end of this month. But there are a couple of different ways that you can join it, um, because this is not just a pervasive problem and an absolutely critical one for the survival of our civilization. It is also very, very actionable. Um, but I want to ask each of you, um, Amy, starting with you, given your unbelievable long and deep engagement with these questions what is what is the single thing you'd like the members of the audience to to do next to take away from this to think about differently um that's a good question I would say you know it's I, I okay sorry I, I focus on accountability right so for me it's really important to understand how we get to um, a problem like the climate crisis and to look at the historical roots of that and um, on all of the different drivers. And I often have people say, um, well, who cares? <laughs> who cares how we got this problem? You know, we need to get to solutions. And I, and I actually think that um, understanding the actual drivers and understanding the problem um, are, are really critical first steps to getting to solutions that that are actually effective. So I would say like, don't feel like you have to skip straight to some silver bullet solution. Um, like it's okay to take your time to understand the problem and where it comes from. And um, it's okay to like find the unique place that you plug in. There's a lot of things that need to, to happen here and um, you don't have to solve everything yourself. Um, you don't have to take an individual approach to, um, you know, dealing with or addressing the climate crisis, like find a group that you can fit in with and, and figure out what skills you have that can help to, um, to progress things. We, we need, you know, we need a big community. So, so yeah, I think those are the two things that I would encourage people to do. That's incredibly helpful. And it is, um, and if we could bring Jasmine back up and we'll take a couple minutes to, to close out. I think that's extraordinarily important and helpful, Amy, because we're all as individuals definitionally outscaled by the climate crisis. It's global. Yeah. And so we need to build connections with other people and to be in league with each other um, as we move forward in order even to feel that we have agency and have purchase yeah. on this, right? It's so also like what one of the enabling 
to survive, you know, I mean, no right. one's gonna, <laughs> you know, we need community to um, both to deal with it on a real basic, like, you know, day to day level, but also to actually have a shot at the sort of systemic change that we need to make. So, um, so yeah, build those ties. Yeah. <laughs> And, and that means in part figuring out there's so many, because these problems are so systemic, there are tons of different places where people have traction. So part of it is figuring out what's your area of influence. Um, so for example, I, I, I saw this campaign at its very beginning in part because I used to practice law, a group of law students formed and they've started evaluating law firms on the basis of mm -hmm. how much representation they do. And this is a way of depriving the top law firms of the top legal talent graduating from law schools. It's an incredibly effective campaign and it started super small back to what you and Mona, Amy, were both saying in, in response to Jasmine's questions. It was just, it was a tiny first step. They had like 12 followers on Twitter, I think when I started following them. Um, and it's grown into a really meaningful campaign. It was highlighted in the New York Times yesterday, for example. It's, oh, awesome. it's had a, having an impact. It's really awesome. Then yesterday, was it, or the day before, 500 academics, academic researchers, scholars, yeah. signed a letter calling on universities to stop accepting fossil fuel financing. It's kind of no money out. There's a divestment push in our higher educational system. And then there's also no money in. We can't take, we can't accept fossil fuel funds and pretend to be advancing humanity's cause with our research. Um, and so I wanted to say to you, Jasmine, that young people have a moral clarity about business as usual because you haven't adjusted to it yet. We're very adaptable as a species. And even when we're fighting not to adjust to things we know are wrong, a part of us does end up adjusting to them. So kind of the three steps two steps back, three steps forward, five steps back, constant negotiation. You guys have moral clarity that is a superpower. And you also have moral authority because as you pointed out, you're going to be in this world and living with the consequences of what we do and don't decide to do. Um, so it's amazing how you've mobilized that traction. Um, and Amy, incredible how you've mobilized your investigative skills. I'm so glad you got tired of your other journalism job. Yay <laughs> for that. Get tired to the world. Videos. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry that it was unpleasant for even a moment. And I'm grateful that you made the change that you made. Um, and thank yeah. you so much for your help with the campaign, which I now want to just take one moment to urge everyone to join. It's we've got about a week left. Um, go over to beyondlies.org. You can download posters. We're also happy to send you some. You can um, get instructions and helps on, on calling your rep. Um, all, no representative should be accepting fossil fuel donations at this point. That's insane. That's psychotic. Um, so we should be calling on everyone to take the no fossil fuel money pledge um, if they want to serve as our elected representative. Um, there are a multitude of ways to get involved with the campaign, including just learning more, as Amy was just suggesting. There are, uh, there's a raft of videos on the website where Amy and other experts to whom she introduced us explain some of the basic tactics and concepts in fossil fuel disinformation so you can build up your media literacy skills. So please join us for the end of this campaign. Thank you for joining us as we kick off the end of the campaign in this event. Thank you, Jasmine and Amy, for your absolutely provocative and excellent contributions. Um, and thanks to everyone for being here with us. We'll be back for our next Talking Climate in late June with Amitav Ghosh, um, the writer of The Great Derangement and The Nutmeg's Curse, for those who are familiar with his work, and um, a, a, a profound thinker on questions of how systems of inequality and systems of climate and ecological crisis have gone into each other's making. So we hope to see you again then. Um, visit our website for more details and have a lovely evening all. Bye-bye.